the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 18, and today we begin our study in verse 20. Let's begin reading in verse 17. Father, we ask that you would add your blessing to the word that we're about to read. In Jesus' name, amen. 1 Samuel 18, verse 17, And Saul said to David, Behold my elder daughter Merab, her will I give thee for a wife. Only be thou valiant for me, and fight the Lord's battles. For Saul said, Let not mine hand be upon him, but let the hand of the Philistines be upon him. And David said unto Saul, Who am I, and what is my life, or my father's family in Israel, that I should be son-in-law to the king? But it came to pass at the time when Merab, Saul's daughter, should have been given to David, that she was given to Adriel, the Meholahite, for a wife. And Michal, Saul's daughter, loved David, and they told Saul, and the thing pleased him. Verse 21, And Saul said, I will give her to him, that she may be a snare to him and that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. Therefore Saul said to David, Thou shalt this day be my son-in-law, through one of the two. Saul said one thing to David. He said something totally different to himself. He told David, he said, You can be my son-in-law. He told himself, David's going to be a dead man before he has a chance to say I do to my daughter telling someone something that you know isn't true or promising to do something that you know you have no intention of doing is sin and it is an ungodly characteristic of people like Saul 22 and Saul commanded his servants saying commune with David secretly and say behold the king hath delight in thee and all his servants love thee now therefore be the king's son-in-law Saul wants his men to lie for him. He wants his men to say, David, the king really likes you a lot. And we all like you too. And as a result, you really should accept his offer to become his son-in-law. 23. (coughs) Excuse me. Saul's servants spoke these words in the ears of David. And David said, Seemeth it to you a light thing to be a king's son-in-law? seeing that I am a poor man and lightly esteemed David is saying I'm a poor man from a poor family what's all this talk about me marrying the king's daughter David is concerned and his concern is not being able to come up with enough money to pay the bride price for a king's daughter because that had to be done in those days you married somebody's daughter you paid her father a bride price and what is he, David, going to pay the king? He doesn't have that kind of money. And so David is saying, you know, this whole marriage thing is way out of my league. 24. And the servants of Saul told him, saying, "This In this manner David spoke. And Saul said, Thus shall ye say to David, The king desireth not any dowry, but a hundred foreskins of the Philistines, to be avenged of the king's enemies. But Saul thought to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. The bride price for David? Not money. The bride price for David? Kill 100 Philistine soldiers and bring proof. Now, that means David has to go up against 100 Philistines and he has to beat every single one of them. If you hit one out of three baseballs, you're doing great. If you make 9 out of 10 free throws, you're doing great. David has to kill 100 out of 100 Philistine soldiers. Or he not only isn't doing great, but he is dead. And that's exactly what Saul hopes will happen. And that's why he gave him this assignment. Verse 26. And when his servants told David these words, it pleased David well to be the king's son-in-law. And the days were not expired. Therefore David arose and went, he and his men, and slew of the Philistines two hundred men. And David brought their foreskins, and they gave them in full measure to the king, that he might be the king's son-in-law. And Saul gave him Michal, his daughter, for a wife.
and I think every muscle in Saul's face must have been in spasm as he tried to smile and look happy over David's victory. And to make matters worse, David completed his mission ahead of schedule. And to make matters even worse, even more worse, David doubled the quota. Poor, pathetic, pitiful Saul. It looks like a fool. And he is one. 28. And Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David, and that Michal, Saul's daughter, loved him. And Saul was yet the more afraid of David, and Saul became David's enemy continually. Then the princes of the Philistines went forth. And it came to pass, after they went forth, that David behaved himself more wisely than all the servants of Saul, so that his name was much esteemed. And so David just continues to grow in popularity, and Saul continues to grow in fear and hate because of it. And like a tail follows a comet, David's trouble follow his successes. David is close to God. God blesses David. And he has great successes. And Saul can't stand it. And so he does bad things to David. The closer we get to Jesus, and the more we do for Jesus, you can bet the more the devil would like to take a cheap shot at us. He doesn't care about some Christian who's lukewarm, but he wants to take cheap shots at those who go all out for the Lord. And the answer is you just keep doing it. Chapter 19, verse 1, And Saul spoke to Jonathan his son, and to all his servants, that they should kill David. Saul's plot to kill David through the Philistines did not work. It actually backfired. David's more popular than ever. The harder Saul tried to put David to death, the more popular David became. Consequently, the king, he is getting really desperate. He now orders his servants, including his son Jonathan, to kill David. Remember, Jonathan is David's best friend. Verse 2. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted much in David... And Jonathan told David, saying, Saul, my father, seeketh to kill thee. Now therefore, I pray thee, take heed to thyself until the morning, and abide in a secret place, and hide thyself. Jonathan disobeyed his father, because his father was sinning, and wanted him to sin also. Family harmony is good, but it is not as good is doing what is right in God's eyes. In other words, holiness before God is more important than happiness in a family. 3. And I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where thou art. And I will commune with my father about thee and what I see that I will tell thee. And I'm sure Jonathan loved his father, but he will not send for him. And I don't care how much we like someone, we must draw the line at sin and say, I'm not going to do it. And so Jonathan is helping David, not trying to kill David. Verse 4. And Jonathan spoke well of David unto Saul his father, and said unto him, Let not the king sin against his servant, against David, because he hath not sinned against thee, and because his works have been toward thee very good. There was no legitimate reason at all to kill David. So Jonathan speaks up for David. No one is helping David except his friend Jonathan. Nobody is standing up for him. You stand by someone when no one else does, and you're going to have a friend for life. Unless that person's a fool and he just doesn't appreciate anything. And that's why Jesus should be the best friend every Christian has. And we should look at him that way because he stands by us. Even when no one else does, he stands by us. He stands by us even though we sin. And he stands by us even though we do not deserve to be on friendly terms with God. He continues to stand by us. Look at 4 and 5 together. And Jonathan spoke well of David unto Saul his father, and said unto him, Let not the king sin against his servant, against David, because he hath not sinned against thee, and because his works have been toward thee very good. For he put his life in his hands, 
and slew the Philistine. And the Lord wrought a great salvation for all Israel. Thou sawest it, and didst rejoice. Why then wilt thou sin against innocent blood to slay David without a cause? Saul's sinful self-focus caused him to ignore David's goodness toward him. Consequently, Saul became ungrateful, didn't appreciate anything that David did for him. And what could he's trying to do? He's trying to hurt him, trying to kill him. One of the best ways to avoid sin is to remain thankful for all that God has done. To appreciate and be thankful for all that God has done. Because the more we remember God's goodness, the less likely we are to sin against God. 6. And Saul hearkened unto the voice of Jonathan. And Saul swore, As the Lord liveth, he shall not be slain. Jonathan reels back, reels Saul back into reality here, at least for the time being. It took a lot of talking, but Saul finally admits that David should not be put to death. And it seems like Saul always wanted to live in non reality where everything he wanted was okay. And it always took an awful lot to reel him back into reality. And that's what Jonathan has done, at least for the time being. 7. And Jonathan called David, and Jonathan showed him all those things. And Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence as in times past. And I'm sure Jonathan loved his dad, like I said earlier. And we know that David was Jonathan's best friend. And as a result, he tries to bring these two together. He tries to get them to get along. And it looks like he's succeeding, at least for now. Verse 8. And there was war again, and David went out and fought with the Philistines and slew them with a great slaughter and they fled from him in the past David stirred up Saul's hatred when he defeated Israel's enemies and he stirred up Saul's hatred when he defended God's honor but that did not stop David from doing it again the Bible says that we are not to grow weary in well doing we might not be appreciated for doing what is right. We may even be repaid evil for doing what is right. But we should not stop doing what is right. Verse 9 And the evil spirit from the Lord was upon Saul as he sat in his house with his javelin in his hand and David played music with his hand. Now, there really is no good reason for a man to be sitting in his house listening to music with a javelin in his hand especially when you have the track record that Saul had so when you think of it there's really no good reason for David to be in this situation he ought to be out of there I mean it would be like sitting in the home of a sniper and trying to relax while he's across the room from you holding a loaded rifle just doesn't make any sense to be in that situation and notice verse 10 and Saul sought to smite David even to the wall with the javelin but he slipped away out of Saul's presence and he smote the javelin into the wall and David fled and escaped that night now remember Saul swore that David would not be murdered and yet here he is trying to murder David himself the Bible says that a man's heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Do not entrust yourself to someone who has a dishonest track record. You don't owe people like that your trust simply because they have said, I've changed. I'm different now. Yeah, well, you need time to prove that they have changed before you trust them. Verse 11. Saul also sent messengers unto David's house to watch him and to slay him in the morning. And Michal, David's wife, told him, saying, If thou save not thy life tonight, tomorrow thou shalt be slain. David has to sneak away under the cover of darkness before morning, or he is a dead man. And David's wife found out about the plot, and he, she warned him. And there's a lesson for us. If someone is being treated unfairly, 
and we have the means to help that person, then it is God's will for us to do that. Twelve. So Michal let David down through a window, and he went and fled and escaped. Remember, Saul gave David his daughter Michal to trap him. Remember that? It was an attempt to kill him. But look, it turns out she helped David escape the trap. I love how God does that for his people. God has this great ability to take what the enemies the enemy means for bad and turn it around and use it for good for his people. Thirteen. And Michal took an image and laid it in the bed, and put a pillow of goat's hair for his head, and covered it with a cloth. And when Saul sent messengers to take David, she said, He is sick. And I would not say that God approved of Michal's sin of lying. I would not say that. But he used it. That doesn't mean he approved of it. And he didn't need it. God does not need our sins to accomplish his will. She may have meant well, but God did not need her sin to save David. The Bible says, let us not do evil. Let us not say, let's do evil, that good may come of it. Verse 15. And Saul sent the messengers again to see David, saying, Bring him up to me in the bed, that I may slay him. That's how much Saul hated David. He finds out that David is sick, in bed, can't get up. Saul wants his thugs to haul David over to his palace in his sick bed so that Saul can kill him. The fact that David evidently was so sick that he couldn't get out of bed didn't seem to matter to Saul at all. He would slaughter a helpless man in cold blood while lying in his sick bed. Not even content to let nature run its course and possibly kill David, he wanted to do it himself. That's how much he hated David. That's what jealousy can do to a person. 16. And when the messengers had come in, behold, there was an image in the bed with a pillow of goat's hair for his bolster. So the thugs realized that there was a decoy in David's bed. Deceptions work sometimes, but not forever. They work sometimes, but only for so long. Sooner or later, the truth comes out. Deceptions are always discovered sooner or later. And deceptions do not change reality either. All they, all they do is maybe put off the day of reckoning for a while. And the deception of David's wife has been discovered. Verse 17. And Saul said unto Michal, Why hast thou deceived me so, and sent away mine enemy, that he has escaped? And Michal answered Saul, he said unto me, Let me go. Why should I kill thee? Dad, David said he was going to kill me if I didn't lie. You know, David never even asked her to lie. She's being real flexible with the truth here. I wouldn't trust her. When she was with David, she stood with David. When she was with David's enemies, she stood with David's enemies. She was all things to all people for her own benefit. And here's a lesson for us. If someone is willing to lie for you, do not be surprised if they lie to you. I won't trust someone who is not honest. Verse 18. So David fled and escaped. He came to Samuel <coughs> excuse me, at Ramah and told him all that Saul had done to him. And he and Samuel went and dwelt in Naoth. And according to Psalm 116, which is sort of a parallel passage to this, David was afraid at this time, running for his life, discouraged at this time. So it was a good time to talk with the prophet Samuel. David is running to God. Talking to someone who will give you God's perspective during stressful times will help put you in a place where the Lord can reel your mind back in and give you a sense of peace so David goes to the right place 19 and it was told Saul saying behold David is at Naoth in Ramah and Saul sent messengers to take David 
And when they saw the company of the prophets prophesying, and Samuel standing as appointed over them, the Spirit of God was upon the messengers of Saul, and they also prophesied. And when it was told to Saul, he sent other messengers, and they prophesied likewise. And Saul sent messengers again the third time, and they prophesied also. This is great. It doesn't matter if a person is saved or unsaved. God can twist and turn that person so that they will do what he wants them to do. These guys came to attack David, but instead they prophesied the word of God. God stopped them, dead in their tracks. Verse 22. Then went he also to Ramah, he came to a great wall, or great well, that is in Siku. And he asked and said, Where are Samuel and David? And one said, Behold, they are at Naoth in Ramah. Verse 23. And he went there to Naoth in Ramah, and the Spirit of God was upon him also, came upon Saul. And he went on and prophesied until he came to Naoth in Ramah. Now remember, in the Old Testament, when the Holy Spirit came upon someone, it was for them to do what God wanted wanted them to do. It's not like in the New Testament when the Holy Spirit comes in the believer. And many times, like was Saul, the people in the Old Testament didn't even know the Lord. And here, Saul is on his way to murder David, but the Holy Spirit intercepts him and causes him to prophesy the word of God instead. 24. And he stripped off his clothes also and prophesied before Samuel in like manner and lay down naked all that day and all that night therefore they say is Saul also among the prophets well his clothes the clothes he removes were his royal clothing and his armor he wasn't totally stripped down but his special royal clothing taken off it was as, it was as if he was stripped down nothing as far as being a king is concerned but the important thing to see is not that whatever the important thing is is that God deterred Saul and all his thugs who came to get David he deterred them he made the spirit of God come upon them and they started speaking the word of God and that bought David some time to get away see that's why David did not need his wife's lies chapter 20 and David fled from Naoth and Ramah and came and said before Jonathan, What have I done? What is mine iniquity? And what is my sin before thy father, that he seeketh my life? David is on the run, once again, and he just does not understand why it had to be that way. He loved God. He minded his own business. He was a good man, and yet he had all this trouble, and he just can't figure it out. Two. And he said unto him, God forbid, Jonathan said, God forbid, thou shalt not die, behold, my father will do nothing, either great or small, but that he will show show it to me. And why should my father hide this thing from me? It is not so. Jonathan just cannot believe his father would do something like that to David. He also cannot believe that his father wouldn't tell him if he was planning something like that Jonathan had an idealistic view of his father Jonathan saw things the way they should be the way he would like them to be not the way they really were look at verse 3 and David swore moreover and said thy father certainly knoweth that I have found grace in thine eyes and he saith, Let not Jonathan know this, lest he be grieved. But truly as the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, there is but a step between me and death. No well-meaning son of a backslidden king will convince David that he's not in big trouble. And Jonathan better step back into reality, or he won't be able to help David. He will actually be a problem for David. Because he keeps telling David it's okay when it's not okay because he wants things to be the way they are not. And we are not good for anyone if we live in non-reality. 
verse 4. Then said Jonathan unto David, Whatsoever thy soul desireth, I will even do it for thee. Now, Jonathan did not believe there was any danger, but David did. Consequently, even though he thought it was a waste of time, Jonathan would do whatever would make David feel better. I suppose he could have argued with David. There's nothing to be afraid of. But instead, he understood David's concerns and acted in an understanding way. And sometimes we have to bend over backwards. Even if we don't believe something is true, if somebody is concerned about something, we should back, bend over backwards 